the tortured soul. The tortured soul. You know, when we think of persecution and torture, um, or being persecuted or being tortured, we think about Christians through the centuries, millennia, that have gone through so much tor torture, so much persecution. And in our minds, we have this mental picture of in, right at the beginning of the early church, how people were thrown to the lions, burned at the stake, uh, saw in half, killed because of their faith and their love for Jesus. Those were the, that was the price that many of them had to pay in the early church in Rome. So in our minds, we have this mental picture of what pain and persecution and torture is all about. But tonight I want to talk to you about a different type kind of torture which so many Christians, even today and through the centuries, have experienced in their lives. You know, we, we often think of ourselves as a, as a body with a soul. But we don't always think of ourselves as a soul in the body. Because we are so focused on the outer. We exercise, we eat healthy, we look after our body so that we can have the best quality life possible for us. And we try to avoid all the toxins of this life, of the physical life. But there's another type of toxin that creeps into a Christian's life and it doesn't creep into my body, it creeps first into my soul and may influence my body. What does our text look like tonight? In verse 18, we read the following. For I have the desire to do what is good. How many Christians here want to do what is good tonight? All of us. Uh, but I cannot carry it out. How many of them would be here? Many of us. I would say all of us. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now that, beloved brothers and sisters, would be the real torture within many Christians' lives today. We don't want that. We are not looking for that. We are not searching for that. But that is our experience. And have you ever found yourself in a place like this? You feel guilty about what you're doing. If I'm going to get cut a little bit close to the bone tonight, um, I'm not going to ask you to forgive me, but I want you to really think about this, because this cuts really deep into every person's life who calls himself a Christian and who are serious with his Christian walk. Because the problem is, beloved brothers and sisters, there's so many things that I do as a Christian, and I feel guilty because it is wrong. And you promised yourself, I will never ever do this again. I am not allow myself to do it. But many of us have said those words, and we have come to a stage where we might experience or feel like, I might as well just give up. Because it doesn't feel like I'm ever going to conquer and win over certain things in my life. Maybe we've come to that stage where we just start to cover it up. I'm fighting a losing battle. This is you tonight. I mean, I feel like that many times. I come to church and I put on my, my church face. I go to my family and I put on my family face. But inwardly, we are tortured by the things that we do not want to do, but we almost feel like a lamb led to the slaughter. And we feel so powerless. But because I cannot have victory and I don't have, often have the victory over it, or I feel like I have victory and then I fall, I have victory and then I fall, I just decide to give up. Because there are certain things in many of us, in our lives, that in one area we are really good, we conquer and we win. But there are certain dark spots in our life, like, I don't want to go there. 
because you're just getting the better of me. And so I started to cover it up. I started to ignore it. And that is the face of inside torture. Look at what scripture says about the torture of the soul. You may read with me from 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 11. He says, dear friends, 1 Peter 2 verse 11. He says, dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires. And then he says this, which war against your soul. Because that is indirectly what sin does. It wages war against my soul, my inner man. And the torture that we as Christians experience today may not be the torture that the church, the early church experienced, or so many tortures that in the past that people have experienced when they were persecuted and they were tortured, they were uh, cut in half, they were burned, they were chased away, they were taken everything of, of everything of them had been taken away. Not that kind of torture but an inner torture in my soul which most people do not know about me. I often look at people and I look at myself. I know myself. I know things about myself which you will never, ever be allowed to know. And then I realize I'd be the only one. Many of us, if not all, walk around with that torture deep within us in certain areas, that sinful desires. And in each one of us, that may look different. Because Satan knows the weakness in our spiritual life. Listen, he knows my weakness. I will never ever tell anybody, not even my wife, about my spiritual weakness. But the Lord knows. And, this, and Satan will not concentrate or focus his attack on the good and the strong things in your life and my life. He will focus on that specific area where he can torture and twist and grab hold and claw into our lives to make our life the most miserable life of all. Torture our soul. And that most of the time lies in the area of sinful desires. We are sometimes tortured by things of the past. Can I give you a picture of somebody who has experienced that torture and he brings it with him? If you want to read with me, Psalm 38. That's a good psalm to read. Psalm 38, verse 3 and verse 4. Verse 3 and 4. I'm going to read from the middle of the B section of verse 3. He says, My bones have no soundness because of my sin. Look at verse 4 when he says, My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. If you and I are really serious about our relationship with the Lord, and if you and I are really serious about living holy, godly, dedicated lives, I tell you, the smallest, in inverted commas, sin will can lead to a tortured heart and a tortured soul. And it can weigh you down. It can be a real burden in our life. Other people may say, you must be mad. But I know in my relationship with God, this is the number one struggle that I sit with. And it is things that I may have done in the past, and I can't get rid of it. And we are overwhelmed by that sin. And we have no inward strength. And because of so many stuff in the past that we carry with us, that secret sin or that past sin that weighs me down. Often I've spoken to people 
And even in my own life, I've experienced things that I've done when I was younger, or even small. There are certain things that raises their head like a cobra, and it just keeps on snapping at me, biting at me. Things that you may have done, or things that we and I, you and I may not have done, in the innocence of our youth, when we were curious about certain things, and we looked where we shouldn't have looked, we have touched where we shouldn't have touched, we have gone where we shouldn't have gone. And those are the things, my beloved brothers and sisters, that follow us from our innocent youth as our childhood. Maybe we have done certain things because we found ourselves in situations out of desperacy because I wanted to cover up. I started to tell lies. I started to do other things to cover up this. And now after years, it's still some baggage that's on my back. I look like a tortoise with a huge shell looking and walking around. And I cannot get rid of it because it keeps on eating away at my soul. Things that are done out of stupidity. You know, when we are young, we are sometimes really stupid when we do things. And some of us may have just overstepped that ultimate boundary of something we did wrong that just keeps on haunting us. It's a sin that may cause real great embarrassment if people would know that. Isn't that the secret that we sometimes sit with? If people would just know that certain thing about my life, I would not be able to face them for the rest of my life. It will hurt my reputation as a pastor or an elder or as a Christian. It will have a devastating effect on myself, and of the people I love. That's why I pray to God, Lord, that, that sin does never surface in my life and ever in my situation. And now, years later, we sit with that situation and we're like Paul in this struggle. When I want to do the good, but when I want to reach out for the good the Lord has told me to do, I find this evil right present with me. And it's a burden today. Tonight it's a burden. And it keeps me guilty. And it weighs me down. The past can be a really terrible thing to bring with you if you do not really deal with it. But then there's something else about the tortured soul. We are tortured by the beliefs of the of, of, of by believing the lies of the enemy. We believe sometimes the spiritual lies that the enemy whisper in our ears. Lies that tells us that you and I will never be free of certain things. That secret sin is your burden, you will carry it. That addiction, you will carry it. That current struggle that you and I have, you will carry that burden with you. Because he tells you, you will never stop watching that. He tells you, you will never stop saying that. You will never stop doing that. That's the lie of the enemy. And you know why we believe that? Because in the past we have struggled so much to overcome that specific anchor in our life. That we have come to that point where we say, I've given up, Lord. If you do not help me, I'm just ignoring this. I just put it out of my mind. I cannot deal with it. And that's why the enemy tells you all the time, I told you so. I told you so. You will never, ever get rid. And because there was some time that you were fighting yourself, you, you know you're going to do this and it's wrong, but... You step and you step in, you step out, you step in and you step out. You just can't seem to get yourself to get to say no. It may not happen at that point in time, but an hour later or two hours later or a next day, you do it. You put your foot into it and you say, Lord, I didn't want to do it. Those are the poison in our souls. Those are the real torture that we experience as 
as Christians. And the enemy just feeds us all these lies. Do you think if by pure coincidence that John writes in chapter 8 verse 44 where he says, he, Satan, is a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him, and when he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and a father of all lies. The enemy will do everything in his power to make you believe that there's no forgiveness and there's no deliverance. These lies, my brothers and sisters, that poison our souls, inwardly, it's torturing us. And Satan will torment us if we do not stop listening to his lies. And that's why my call to you tonight from God's word is that we do not listen to his lies. Jesus has said in John 4, he's the father of all lies. Do not let the lies of the enemy or the sins of your past tie you and lead you into the grave. Live in freedom. You need to speak to your soul tonight. May the Spirit of God just rise up in us tonight and say, listen, you must speak to your soul. You speak life and not death. You know, there are two types of Christians. There are those who confess their sin and there are those who hide. Those are the two types of Christians. But Scripture says, the Bible says, the Word of God says, it is better to confess than to hide your sin. What is the best for you and what does God desire is that we confess. Proverbs 28, verse 30. Can I ask you to turn with me to that verse? That's a real good verse. When it, now that we are talking about, what do I tell my soul? I tell my soul, soul, it is better to confess than to hide. Proverbs 28 verse 13 says, now listen to this, there's some real good stuff here. He who conceals or cover his sin does not prosper. Alright, that is the first thing. You will never experience growth if you cover your sin. But whoever, now listen to this, but whoever confesses and renounce, then will find mercy. Three things that you need to con you need to consider here. The first thing is confession. Confession is part of forgiveness. I must confess. Confess is to acknowledge. And to acknowledge in this context is to say, Lord, I am wrong. And there are some of us cannot say we are wrong. That's just beyond us. But he who confesses. Now, I must say that many of us are willing to confess. We are sometimes more than willing to confess. But this verse says something else. Have a look at it. He says, whoever confesses and, help me, renounce. Renounce, renounce means to reject. We are more than happy to confess certain things, but we are not more than happy to pray for them. We like the, what is, it? is it Peter that says we are like a dog that goes to his back to his vomit? It's Peter that says that, isn't it? I can, I can vaguely recall that. We are like the, the, the pig, what do you call it? Pig, 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 the pig, pig, and goes back to the muddy puddle. We roll around in that. And that's the Lord says, if we are have that kind of heart, we will never experience the freedom from the torture because many of us confess. That's not our problem. Our problem and the torture in our hearts is that we cannot get delivered from the thing that we struggle with because we are not willing to reject that and say, Lord, I need to be free from the sin. Then scripture says, if you confess and if you reject, 
What is the consequences of that? What is the fruit of that? You will find mercy. Mercy. You see, unconfessed sin, beloved brothers and sisters, is like poison to the soul. It hurts and it kills and it destroys. It hurts me. It hurts other people. It kills every, everything that is good in my life. I may grow in other areas, but that sin kind of kills everything that is good which God brings about in my life. Because it overshadows all the other good sections in my heart and in my life. It destroys, sin can destroy my relationship with God, it destroys my relationship with my brothers and my sisters, with my family. It destroys. But confession must happen. Because ultimately, confession is the goal. And rejection is the goal. I must not just confess, I must reject. Now confession is done in two ways. Can I just share that with you? I've got, this is not my book. I got it from another part. It was very good. I thought myself, I must share this with you. Confession. Confession to, uh, we confess to God for forgiveness. We confess to our Lord for forgiveness. 1 John 1 verse 9. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and he is just and he is willing. Faithful, just and willing to forgive us of our sin and purify us from all <coughs> unrighteousness. The thing is that we have become tired of trying to confess something that we feel like it's a losing battle. And we've stopped altogether. We try to put it out of our mind. Because every time when we struggle with that specific sin or whatever, and we come to the Lord, it's like, here I am again, Lord. Oh, not again. Am I the only normal, well, simple, normal person here? It's like, here I rock up at the throne of God and I say, Lord, it's me again with the same thing. And then we think our Lord is like us. Like, I'm getting annoyed with myself. Maybe God gets annoyed with me. And now I start to ignore that. But I should come and confess. I should not say, oh, not again. Because confession is like the detoxication of my soul from all the poison of sin. Confession brings freedom in my life that I can just walk around and just enjoy what God has given me. Confession stops the torment in my soul. Because confession ultimately leads to our Lord, according to Micah 7 verse 19, is taking our sin and he chucks it in the deepest ocean, just to drown away and sink, never ever to be found. If God's word is saying one thing to you tonight, and especially thinking of Micah 7 verse 19, let go of the things that you hold on to, which you think you cannot be delivered from. Let go of that. Bring it to our Lord. Because as long as you and I hold on to it, and we say it will never ever happen, God cannot intervene with grace into our heart. So we confess to God for forgiveness, but we also confess to people for healing. That's the other side. James 5 verse 16 says, and you know that verse, for whoever confesses his sins, um, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed.
getting to where I'm going with this. A church, your pastor has committed adultery. What an idiot. You don't blab out your confession to everybody. You gauge their relationship with God. And if it's really the Lord that leads you to confession, can I trust people? In general, I don't trust people because I know people. I've been working with them for many years. There are certain things that you just bring to the Lord. Believe me. Are you with me? And there are certain things that you need somebody just to hear and confess that thing. I need some prayer. I need some forgiveness. Just listen to me. I need to confess, I need to restore this relationship between us. That's why it's so important. At the end of the day, beloved brothers and sisters, the torture of my soul can only be solved when Christ sets me free. And that's where the answer of sin lies. That's why when you read our portion of scripture, can I just can we just go to that again? Look at this, because it looks like the chapter 7 ends like in a negative. So then, my, um, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but a slave, but, uh, but in the sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. It looks like there's no solution. But you can ask my pastor Crosby there in the Greek, there is no like chapter 8 there. It just flows into the writing of the one verse into another verse. There's no chapters in the original language. So it should be saying, but in the sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. <coughs> Therefore, because of this whole thing that I feel so caught up and I cannot overcome the struggle, therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Someone say amen. amen. That's where the answer of the tormented soul lies. Not in trying to solve something from the past, which is done, damage is done. Not to try to deal with it here and hide it, or ignore it, or to mask it. But to bring it to the cross out of desperacy and say, Lord, I know I cannot do anything about this. I know this may be the thousand or ten thousand times I've come to you. But I cannot just ignore this. I cannot just sweep it under the rug. I cannot close my eyes. I cannot just put my mind somewhere else. I need to deal with this, Lord. And then our God says this. Not one more. Not the Reformed faith. Not the church. But the word of God says. Therefore there is no condemnation. And I say this to you. If you come to Jesus tonight, there is no condemnation. the riches, the riches of God's grace. <laughs> and then it, 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 as if Paul wants to just rub it in, <laughs> just throw it on us, that he has lavished. You must have a lot to lavish, mate. You must have a lot. And God has a lot of forgiveness and love for his children because his son lived here and he knew what it is to be, to be tempted experience a broken world and he lavished it on us and then John comes and he writes in his, in his letter chapter 2 verse 1 which we have read my dear children I write this to you so that you will not sin 
That's so clear. God doesn't want us to sin. He never wants us to sin. But here's the but factor. The but, if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And he's the one that forgives. He's the one that takes and turns my tortured soul into a soul of freedom. Then the Lord says in John chapter 8, verse 36. So if the Son has set you free, you will be free indeed. The freedom tonight, beloved brothers and sisters, is only found in Christ. The greatest need of all. Accept that. Say amen. amen. Let's pray together. <coughs> wow. Lord, what else can we say than just wow? It's too much for our brains to process. But our soul, our tortured soul sometimes by the enemy sucks up and drinks up every word that you've given to us tonight. Father, tonight in our heart in this church I want to pray 